the onset of coronavirus, um, several major tabletop gaming conventions, such as GaryCon, have been cancelled. And, well, it's not unreasonable to suspect that this year's Gen Con, as well as some of the PAXs following PAX East, may suffer the same fate. With that in mind, after much deliberation, I have decided that I am not going to hold off on reviewing my tabletop licensed novels until later in the year. I'm going to review them now. So this time, I am going, or rather I should say, I'm going to review them as I come to them. So... This time, I am going to review the second Dragonlance novel, Dragons of Winter Night. Dragons of Winter Night, as a novel, runs into the problem of adapting what was the first adventure path as we think of it into a trilogy of books. A bunch of material has to be skipped over. We start off after the hammer, retrieval of the Hammer of Cross and the reunification of Dwarven society, which would later be covered in the book Dragons of the Dwarven Depths, which I have previously reviewed. Well, that kind of is actually setting the tone somewhat for how the book plays out. The book itself opens with the heroes of the lands traveling to the city of Tarsus in an attempt to secure ships to carry the refugees from Solace to safety, safety. Only to discover that the city has become, since the cataclysm, landlocked. Not long after their arrival, the party ends up being split up and, well, Weiss and Hickman don't juggle the plots well. Of the two parties, one being Caraman, Raceland, Tannis, Riverwind, and Goldmoon in one, and then Sturm, Lorana, Gilthanus, Tasselhoff, Burfoot, Flint, and Elistan in the other, their stories aren't balanced particularly well. Once the party is split, Tannis's group gets the focus to the detriment of Lorana's group. It's enough of a degree that while both parties are going after uh, different ones of the same MacGuffin, the Dragon Orbs, by the time we've gone through the plot of Tannis's group and they've recovered their dragon orb, but then we've shifted perspective back to Lorana's party, Lorana's group has gotten their own dragon orb through their own adventures, accompanied by some very significant character development, all entirely off camera. Look, I don't have problems with referring to off screen adventures in the story. Uh, we'd like, we'd gotten this actually at the start of Dragons of autumn twilight but it's something else when the adventure in question is important to the plot and characterization and happens over the course of the book the latter half of dragons of winter night is all right it puts more focus on lorana and sturm but it doesn't keep the focus on them instead we get another significant detour back to tannis and company which detracts from lorana and sturm's part of the story this is a significant bummer, because ultimately, Lorana and Sturm's characterization and their plot arc are the standout portion of the story. Lorana returns to her people in exile, and ultimately has to decide whether her place is to stay with the heroes of the Lance and have agency and an impact on the events of the world, or staying with her people and her family and, those, and her ties with them, but in the process, being relegated to the background losing a her ability to have an impact on events, to having a sense of, not necessarily power, but a sense of control over her own life and destiny that she would have, than what she would have had traveling and adventuring. It's a very intensely written sequence that plays out incredibly well, but it would go so much better if we had the context that had gone with it of Lorana leading her portion of the Heroes of the Lance and coming to her own as a leader as they go through fighting a dragon high lord, killing him and his dragon, and claiming one of the dragon orbs. Now, all of this is covered much later in a book written after the fact, much as with Dragons of the Dwarven Depths, and that's fine, but it doesn't help this book. Then finally, on top of all of that, there's Sturm Brightblade. At the start of Dragons of Autumn Twilight, he was the textbook definition of the lawful anal paladin. He was butting heads with Raceland, not because Raceland's a grim, dark edgelord, but because Raceland is a mage and Sturm is a paladin. He was butting heads with Riverwind and Goldmoon because they believed in clerical magic and came from another society than what he was familiar with. But then, in Dragons of Winter Night, he ends up meeting a bunch of members of the modern Knights of Salamnia, encapsulated perfectly through the character of Derek Crownguard, a perfect 
there but for the grace of Paladin go I moment for Sturm, if there ever was one. And indeed, it is that for him. By the end of the book, Sturm has undergone a tremendous amount of character growth. Both he and Lorana have come become two of the most well-rounded and fleshed-out characters in the series, with Sturm going from the start of book one, being basically the Dragonlance, the Kryn equivalent of the U.S. agent, to being, about the end of Dragons of Winter Night, being Captain America. It's just that, well, a massive amount of development is off-page, because we meet, or I should say, Sturm and Lorana's party, party meets Derek Crownguard and several other Knights of Salamnia during those events fighting that dragon high lord and all of that so there's a whole massive amount of time when those characters are interacting and sturm is kind of coming to terms with what he's his vision of what the knights of salamnia are and what he want on his interpretation of what he wants being a knight of salamnia to be him going through that all of that is off page and by the time either party returns to the forefront of the story where they end up on camera at center stage Sturm has come to a decision for what he wants of what his vision of what the Knights of Salamnia are and what type of person he wants to be and the question then for him becomes how does he do that but that journey there that we skipped over is important to him and his character growth and it's just not there it's something that we basically had to wait almost 40 years for well not 40 like closer to like 30 years for but still too long and this book suffers for it tremendously and all of this comes to a head all of these problems come to a head because and i can't beat around the bush here any further Sturm dies at the end of this book it is a sacrifice that is both heroic and tragic and completely within the events of the story and the characters aren't made all the more poignant because of who kills him. However, the whole story of Lorana's party, the whole story of Sturm's growth, all of this would have worked so much better if it had just gotten its own book. Ultimately, this book rereading it after years since I first read it in like middle school and high school and also having come to this with the Lost Chronicles series in mind with um, Dragons of the Dwarven Depths and honestly more knowledge of how the adventure path plays out I've come to the conclusion that this is a book series that needs four or five books not three like leave Dragons of Autumn Twilight as it is it is a excellent book and it fits in very well sets everything up nicely then basically take the events of Dragons of the Dwarven Depths as far as what happens in that adventure because what happens there is important to the character development of Flint. Yes, I know it came out later, but you know what I mean. Like, take those take the events of that adventure because that adventure had been published already. Keep that through to the party reaches Tarsus and splits. Then that is a good place for a cliffhanger. At which point, then you do one book that follows Tannis's party and one book that follows Lorolana's. That's actually how Tolkien intended originally to have the uh, Lord of the Rings play out. It wasn't supposed to be four It wasn't supposed to be three books. It was supposed to be like five. Uh, with one book following Frodo and Sam and one book following the other half of the of, well, the Fellowship of the Ring with you know, Aragorn and Gimli and Legolas and um, Merry and Pippin. In the same way, you follow each book follows one of the split parties in parallel. You have Hannes's party going all the way through to um, basically covering sparse some of the events of the next book, which I'm not going to get too far into, but covering into uh, reaching Flotsam and meeting the and discovering that well one of their old friends is turns out to be a dragon high lord and having that revelation there and then also have the same thing go and they also have um Lorana's story going on running in parallel 
You can read them either one in, in either order you want, um, and if each one informing the other. And narratively, then, you also get interesting, like, parallel plot beats there, depending on which one you want to read first. You will still get certain common plot beats, because both Sturm and Tannis get, like, the twist revelation of, oh, this person who I thought we, who, from my, from my past, who I trusted, turns out to be, oh, you know, I'm, it's, okay, what, what am I saying? Well, holding off the spoiler, it's Kitiara. With the revelation that Kitiara is a dragon high lord, um, that having that revelation happen, like, that doesn't happen at the same time in either book, but, um, having it in the parallel books gives a big twist for that book, and then when you read each both of them, you also get the double hook of of when Kitiara leaves um, Flotsam. If once you've read Sturm and, Lor and Lorana's party's book, you get the hook of you get the the hook of oh she's leaving to do this. Or if you've read um, and then if you read Tannis's book first, you go oh um, that's where she went when she left, or that sort of thing. So you got that going for it, and then once the once the heroes of the lance reunite, that's where I rather say is once they approach the point where they're going to reunite, that's where you start the next book. Is you start the next book with leading up to them reuniting, they reunite, and then the final confrontation with the, with um, Ariacus and the followers of Tachesis and Dragon to Spring Dawning. I bring all this up because at this point in fantasy literature, keep in mind, we, we are predating the loose thematic series like um, the forms of fantasy literature, both from TSR, like the Harper series, to, um, stop, to just longer ongoing for decades series like Wheel of Time, or even the publication of the first of the Game of Thrones novels, which was actually in the 80s. Those weren't out yet. So, at this point, kind of in fantasy literature, the whole thing is, oh, if you're doing a, if you're doing a series of fantasy novels as opposed to standalones, novellas, or that sort of thing, or anthology books like The Thieves' World, you have to do a trilogy. Because, like, I think at this point still, Fafford and the Grey Mauser was a series of novellas. And novellas and short stories. Conan was a series of novellas and short stories with occasional, like, actual novel-length book, like with um, Red Nails. Whereas if you do an epic heroic fantasy, if you're doing a series, you've only got three, because that's what Lord of the Rings did, and that's... don't go longer than Tolkien. So, in either case, I don't know whether this... the a decision to go with the trilogy, whether it was Weiss or Hickman's idea, or whether it was TSR's idea... The book itself is, is good. It's not my disappointment in the book and my wish that things were structured differently isn't because I think the book is bad. It's I think that it could have been better. This is my inner mental editor going, literary editor going, you know, a publisher, can we get like two, like two more books? A Margaret, Tracy, why not take these two plot threads for these characters, split them up, give them their own books, give them time to breathe, um, incorporate these bit, like, this bit that's off camera, flesh that out, stick it, actually stick it in there, um, for both of them, and do it that way, because, like, it's, this book has the glimmer of an even better book, or I should say pair of books, waiting to be unearthed. It is a Clearly, a diamond in the rough. Now, if you're interested in picking this book up, it is available from Amazon and print, Kindle, and audiobook versions. I listen to the audiobook. It's a very good one. Uh, links to them will be in the show notes. Buying anything through those links will help support the site. I'm also going to have a link to Powell's. That is not an affiliate link. Um, consider checking it out, picking it up from Powell's as well. I'm actually going to see if Powell's has the um, annotated Chronicles available, and I'll put that if they do, I will put a link to that one in there. Because I also own the, a physical copy of the annotated version. And 
need to get around to rereading it with the annotations as well. Um, I like I like annotated books like this. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. <laughs>